Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. Um, and, you know, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about, you know, obviously he's sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X programs. But uh, Ross, what I love hearing about is the challenge stories. Like what are the, some of the, the crazy times? And he talked about when he drove cross country and he was first getting started, he uh, made money for food and rent by being a street mime. So he'd actually be a street performer and put his head on the street. Whatever he made that day is what he used for food and rent money. Uh, Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talked about growing her company at $20 million with five employees and selling to Disney, um, but was, was amazing to hear her challenges of beating cancer twice. And uh, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor and Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. That and many more, it, you know, I asked him that, you know, Ross, and I don't wanna like ruin the punchline, but people can go to inspiredinsider.com and watch the episodes. But, you know, he said, you know, Jeremy, if a punk kid, I don't remember the exact terms he used, if a punk kid came to you, who's like 21, and asked you at the equivalent of that time, maybe 50,000, he said was maybe 300 or 400,000, would you give it to that, guy, that kid? And I'm like, uh, I mean, who would know it would be Steve Jobs, right? Who would know that? So uh, he's, I'm like, okay, no, that's fine. Like, fair enough. <laughs> but you're probably kicking yourself right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if anyone's made a decision. Give him a little that, less money. Yeah, give him a little less money. Just right. Take a small part of that <laughs> you, for it. That would, that would have still been um, uh, pretty amazing for him. Um, yeah. But check out inspiredinsider.com and the episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And, you know, I think just like Ross thinks, you know, content marketing is literally the best thing since sliced bread will help your business. That's how I feel about podcasting. But um, it's a lot more personal for me than just business. Uh, it was actually inspired. I was inspired to start podcasting by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only members to survive. And you're thinking, what does this have to do with podcasting? Well, his words and legacy live on because an interview was done by the Holocaust Foundation. Um, and uh, you can watch it on my about page of Inspired Insider. I have the whole... Uh, interview there. It's it's has graphic details of what he went through, so just be aware of that. Um, but his legacy lives on because of an interview, and so I consider it my responsibility when I have people on that I'm helping them leave a legacy. So yes, I personally credit podcasting as the best thing I've done for my business and my life, but it also helps my guests leave a legacy. So if you have questions. Um, you can go to rise25.com or support at rise25media.com and email us. So um, I'm super excited about today's guest, by the way, and a shout out to Chris Dreyer, who's founder of rankings.io. And hey, they help personal injury law firms dominate first page rankings. And also, if you go to today's uh, you know, guest website um, with Siege Media, um, they help brands scale with SEO focused content marketing. Um, and so I'm going to give a brief introduction for Ross, who's an amazing entrepreneur and, um, you know, he's doing some amazing things to help other entrepreneurs as well. So, um, today we have Ross Hodgins, uh, Ross Hodgins founded Siege Media in 2012. Siege made the Inc. 5000 each of the last three years and currently has offices in San Diego, Austin, New York City. In 2018, Siege was also named one of Inc.'s best workplaces. And there are more than 85 people working on creating amazing content and helping companies get to the top of search engines and get more clients. And if you look at their client list, it's pretty amazing. Um, they've helped brands like Airbnb, TripAdvisor, Shutterfly, Zillow, Intuit, Audible, so many more. I you know, don't want to take the time to name right now, but um, check out their website, siegemedia.com. And he also runs Growth Comment, which is a training 
community and course for agency and consultants and they help businesses grow. And he runs that with Jonathan Dane of Client Boost, which has also been a guest on the podcast. So uh, Ross, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, there's so much to talk about and uh, I want to get into some of the ways you help companies. Um, you know, you have SaaS companies, e-com companies, you have a long list of case studies on your website, but I want to start off with, you know, in this climate now, whenever people are listening to this, there's craziness going on with um, coronavirus and a crisis. And, and there's always, you know, I was watching an old interview with you and there's also um, an ask me anything uh, about you, which I read almost all of the comments um, on Reddit. And the funny thing is, and that was, maybe, I don't know if it was six years ago or it was, a, it was a while ago. And people were like, what do I do in the crisis of blah, 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 blah. And there was one of the comments in, or the, or the change in link building. And I was thinking, there's always some kind of crisis in link building or something going on with SEO. So you're, you're probably, I don't know, used to it, but you probably had to shift and iterate a lot in this industry. So I'm curious, you know, what's going on now? Um, what are you doing in this climate? Yeah, I mean, from a content marketing perspective, directly for a lot of our clients, we are trying to um, pivot more strongly. We did a lot of work targeted at national news and things like that. But obviously, national news reporters are pretty busy with a more important story. So it's been pretty difficult to get their ear. But we've been lucky. And this is one of our philosophies generally is, generally is to have a diversified content marketing strategy that appeals to bloggers and also uh, organizations and basically aligns to where the client's audience is. So we, for those clients, we just kind of shut off that top part um, and pivoted to those other areas. Although from um, the client side, uh, for, we haven't completely excluded it. Someone on our team who used to work at Upworthy had the great suggestion that people want good news right now. So there's a yeah. phrase called counter programming where you can also give reporters good news and that'll give you a shot to kind of get in the door. I, I still don't know that you really want to pry yourself into that door, but um, we found some effectiveness with that and also elsewhere too, because people just want good news right now. So do you find that it's better to sell you said counter programming. It's funny how counter program is. It's like the good news because the program is all about negative things or a lot of yeah. things are. Is that exactly? Yeah. yeah. That's the thought process is like something that's uplifting, um, positive story, uh, funny, like those kind of angles are going to be more likely to get covered versus like even something slightly negative that, but maybe it's not about coronavirus that often actually checked a lot of boxes for national news because it's like something that's a hot button subject but that's just not working right now because they just have they have stuff that's going to get more clicks and reads for them um, for obvious reasons yeah i would all love to hear your philosophy around content and i i tell everyone go check out their blog and obviously you have some amazing videos that you've produced and also done interviews with and um there was a video you did about uh, or a couple, uh, and I'd love to hear the your philosophy around the keys for viral content. There's a, you check out, there's a video that you talk about how to promote your blog to a million yearly visits, um, but, and it probably has some of your philosophy around it, but just in general, um, maybe some of your philosophies around um, creating viral content or just creating good content. Yeah, I, I still, um interested to see or hear what post that is in particular. I, I generally say we actually don't try to create viral content that often. It's a mm. nice side effect that happens. But I do think one way we describe our philosophy is singles. We try to go for singles, doubles, triples consistently versus the big um, thing that can strike out. Like you try to go for home runs, you're going to strike out, right? Yeah. You're going to hit some home runs too. But um, we also believe that's kind of what SEO Google is looking for is like a real brand is not just these giant viral sp spikes. They're incremental growth um, in terms of links to, to that site and also just the content generally. And also brands are built by a consistent, I describe it like 2x experience and experience that's even like 1.2 to 1.5x than ever, better than everyone else. If you do that 40 times, if you do 40 podcasts that are great, 
and they're 1.2 X better than everyone else, they're only going to listen to you. But if you just, just one big thing that's once every three months, you might not even build a brand off of that, honestly. So that's kind of the one of the ways we think about it for our clients. So obviously consistency is key. Um, and what about, okay, you, I mean, you take some of the best hitters of all time. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk, we won't talk Barry Bounds cause he was kind of home. Tony Gwynn. Uh, Tony Gwynn, exactly. Perfect example. There's kind of the fundamentals of singles. What are some of the components you want to make sure that are in your <clears throat> content for something like that? Yeah. So our strategy is we, we try to tie to search volume every time out. So the reason we go singles is they, they real ha- they have real brand um, value. So it might rank for something like uh, types of ins- car insurance or something like that. And someone that's a mid tier thing and that concept itself, you can just hear it and know that that's not going to get a hundred links. But if you can get even five links to that, it ranks, uh, it's in the right place in the funnel. And you do that 40 times with everything else in that funnel. That's far more valuable than, um, even one piece that goes viral gets 50 to hundred links one time. And then you don't have that search volume compounding. Um, but that's one, that's one component. Also we try to get content ranking for our clients, which allows them to naturally acquire links too. So that's just a na- uh, part of our strategy as well Is we don't want to be a manual link building company. We want to more accelerate yeah. the velocity of your own link acquisition. Yeah. Well, what I love about how you think about things and I don't know if you realize it because you just probably do it unconsciously is you start with the data. Okay. Like when you were talking about that post, how to promote your blog to a million yearly visits, you'll have to watch it. I don't want to spoil it. You have to go, go to find it on <laughs> YouTube or wherever. But um, you start with the data and it seems like before you produce a great piece of content, you look at the search volume, you look at like certain metrics and then produce a piece of data, by the way. Um, I am so guilty of not doing anything like that. And like, this sounds interesting to me. <laughs> I should probably go to like what, what's actually being searched. Right. And that's something that, you know, you do just unconsciously that most people probably don't even think about. I, I, I think there is room for what you said there or like yeah. for business development content, we try to do more thought leadership stuff. And that's mm-hmm. often what you're thinking about, not, with someone searching because so I think if you are in a B2B market that can make sense and you still don't want to ignore search volume by any means, but Oh, trust me. I ignore it. I ignore it. (laughs) (laughs) So there's about, I think there's a balance. There are people that use that too much and then they go to their sites and they feel robotic and they can't build a brand off that either, which is its own problem. Yeah. So a combination of the two, what are some, I mean, you mentioned some and you've had, uh, you know, Rand Fishkin I've had on, and uh, great book, Lost and Founder. Um, shout out to him. You've had him on, um, which was good also. Um, you know, what tools do you recommend people look at or use? And I know Moz is, is one of the ones. You've been featured on Moz. Yeah, Moz is good. Um, our kind of go-to right now is Ahrefs. It's just an amazing, powerful tool. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have probably heard of it from an SEO and competitive research standpoint. SEMrush is good as well. If I had to pick one out of everything, it would be Ahrefs. Honestly, if I was a small business, I think that's by far the most bang for your buck. Mm. From an outreach standpoint, we use Buzzstream. It's kind of our digital PR CRM where Mm -hmm. we manage a lot of our relationships and and, um, outreach through that. So that's a big, those two kind of um, fit the, the, the gamut there. And also clear scope is another one that a lot of people might not have heard of, but that one's good for kind of recommending common terms that might show up for a given topic. So if you said something, you wrote a post on how to increase website traffic, but you didn't say Twitter or Facebook, that would be kind of weird for Google. So they often rank stuff based on what are those common words that topics like this show. So mm-hmm. what clear scope will do will tell you which words should appear on content. Yeah. So that's a nice short ch- shortcut. It's also good for giving freelancers too. Uh, sometimes you can get to those things automatically without thinking, but in technical spaces or for freelancers, it's a good um, thing. Yeah, to that's awesome. Thank you. And Ahrefs, Ahrefs, was that around, how long has that been around? Like when you early on, what, were you using something like that or no? 
No, it really was. Ma, uh, Ahrefs has come, you know, I, I don't even know the timeline exactly. It was Ma's for sure to start, but Ahrefs mm. has kind of accelerated okay. in the last five years to be the best product, which props to them. I don't know if you've looked at um, Rand's new company and if anyone's listening to it, maybe not be new anymore, but Spark Toro. What have, have you looked into that at all? Yeah. So I'm actually uh, an angel investor. Oh, okay. Yeah, it yeah. sounded it's amazing when he was describing it. So <laughs> yeah, it's great. Congratulations in advance for that. For that. Yeah. It seems like it's not a bad <laughs> uh, investment so far. So we'll, we'll see how it progresses, but Rand's a great operator. So I feel what was, Besides, obviously, you invest in the, in the jockey, um, but what was it that was enticing about the, the company and what they were creating that was enough, com- you know, compelling enough that you're like, I'm going to put money behind it? Yeah, I, they are in audience research and uh, promotion. So I think there were, and that's one reason Rand re- reached out to us, I'm pretty sure, is that we're in a comparable space. So I could actually add value, hopefully, in the product and make suggestions, which is a positive. Um, yeah, Rand, the jockey. I mean, I did think biasly, like it's a good way to kind of get to know Rand better. And even that relationship is, it has its own value. Um, of course you shouldn't put dollar signs on all your relationships, but uh, that was consideration as well. Just getting to know Rand better. Yeah, totally. Uh, but yeah, had faith in, I didn't put a ton of capital in, um, but yeah, put some cash behind it and yeah. it feels like it's the right move so far. That's awesome. Um, I want to talk about some case studies because you know i have a lot of people i know and who listen they're SaaS company you help SaaS companies e-com companies i listed a bunch of companies one of my favorite companies or favorite products is audible i love it um, so i want to hear about how you helped audible or how you started working with audible but case studies there were two that kind of stuck out to me on your site and whichever one you think would be um better to talk about but there was a SaaS one and an e-com one SaaS, I mean, there's many of them, but the SaaS, there's an e-com, it said zero, it caught my eye, zero to 365,000 a month in traffic value, traffic value for e-commerce company. Um, or the other one I saw was that stuck out was a SaaS company, 131% growth. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. One of those um, would be a better story. Yeah, happy to... We could we could start with uh, start the, with the econ the econ one yeah yeah start with the econ. so when it, when I say that specifically that's a client um, I feel like I want to be considerate of not going into too much detail although these are all you can find them on um, the site for context but to kind of like paint it at a high level this is a client in flower delivery mm-hmm. so um, what we help them with is just a content marketing strategy on their blog. It was kind of starting from scratch. So what we did was a lot of high quality content um, to, tied to the top and middle funnel. So examples might be like uh, rose etiquette or flower etiquette or um, gifting or types of flower types of roses or f- uh, rose meaning. Like when you're sending someone roses, you want to make sure you're not saying something offensive. So these kind of these are the kind of searches. Rose someone might, meaning. Might, yeah. Is there a way to offend someone by sending certain roses? Oh, you could, uh, I don't think that one in particular, oh, oh, but okay. there are, there are like other flower meetings. That so then I'm probably, or, yeah. Good thing I don't send, ro- or don't give my wife roses or I'd fend her too much. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely funeral flower etiquette and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Going through. Like get them. Yeah. That would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we apply SEO best practice to those articles in terms of what the topic kind of requires from a from a quick answer standpoint. So we're solving for what are people quickly wanting to get out of that in terms of the structure and we outline it that way. Then we have a design team of around 35 people that build beautiful visual assets, specifically in flowers. Obviously you can imagine it's pretty inspirational and needs to look good. So our designers will mock up a lot of different assets that are nice to look at and make it easy to digest that content and share it. Those will help those rank, but we'll also do a lot in the top funnel where it'll just be brand awareness. Maybe it's like printable gift ideas for your mom or something that's kind of, you might send your mom flowers or something like that. So we'll print out, um, we'll create nice printables. We'll actually take uh, print them, take photos of them in context. And then we'll actually pitch that content to bloggers to get links back to, to that client. 
um, to build their authority. So we'll do that on the top and middle funnel while also benefiting their bottom funnel pages like roses, um, fl send flowers, Mother's Day flowers by building their overall authority from that work. Um, and also we'll get links to those pages through the process of content creation. So when we say traffic value, it's what that value is specifically on the blog, although we definitely impact the bottom funnel too. You know, see, I love how you think. You think a next level. Most people are, and you had a you had a great video of you with two other SEO people, guys. Um, and most people aren't thinking. I got to put a piece of content out. You're not only thinking the background research, but you're thinking, is it going in a top funnel or middle funnel? And so, <laughs> and, and most people, I mean, that I when I talk to you about this, aren't thinking at that level. And I'm, I'm sure it goes way deeper than that. And again, this is just something you do naturally you do naturally over so many years and i don't know if you realize you're even having that thought process but to someone like me who doesn't think of it like that it's like oh i need to think about where they're going to be uh coming into the funnel and when you're talking to those two two gentlemen um they were like you need to plan out the goal for that piece of content Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. We, we always say every single piece of content should have a distribution strategy, um, no matter what. Typically, it's like search volume, like it should be able to, if we believe it can rank or we do email outreach to it to generate links to it. Um, you can also do mentioned outreach like, oh, Jonathan was on this post. We think Jonathan will distribute the podcast because he's on it. Um, and then social is obviously a big component as well. If you have a big enough audience, but most people don't have a big enough audience to get visibility. So they have to do one of the other things that they're going to get anyone to watch their stuff. So yeah. if you don't, if we don't think about that, yeah, it's wasted effort basically. You know, I feel like some companies don't, some companies see the light, they see the vision of this is really not only a short term benefit but a long-term benefit for their company and their brand what are some of the things holding people back from making an investment in their content when you talk to them yeah it's, it's a significant investment for one uh, fco definitely takes a long time so if you're a brand new site and it kind of relates to the SaaS traffic growth case study you, you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. it's it's it takes 12 months probably of spending at least in, in competitive markets, I'm spending at least 10K most likely to really even start seeing momentum. So it's basically the belief that that's going to come. And if you do it well, it will come, but it's, it is a 12 month slog um, to get there. So I think that's the, one of the major reasons that SEO is a channel, just people don't invest in it either. It's just, it takes so long. But in the SaaS example, and this is one of the positives for these companies that have kind of been around for a while, they have some authority already. Um, so we were able to get them more quicker growth, which can often be in six months. If you already have a baseline of authority, you've been around, maybe you haven't been deliberate, but that has helped you potentially accelerate the pace of results that a brand new website would not have. Yeah. And I look, you look at your, so anything else around the SAS example, uh, case study that would be important with the 131% growth. Yeah, I mean, another component we haven't really touched on that we do think about with new websites is we do do a keyword opposition at benefit analysis. So what this is saying is basically how valuable is a topic and then how competitive is it? So this allows newer businesses to also go after keywords earlier that actually have value to them and have a capability of ranking for um, as compared to a very competitive term like Mother's Day Flowers, no brand new flower company can rank for that in 12 months. But maybe they could rank for a long tail version of that. Um, and if they prioritize that in their content marketing strategy, they can keep the lights on, find ways to keep sending them money. But that's one thing we do think about and, and applied in a clever tap example. It's like going after lower difficulty stuff until we can level up to the higher difficulty stuff. What's your philosophy, Ross, on you know, taking an amazing piece of content that you help the company produce and paid traffic versus organic? Well, often in the, in the top, in the middle funnel areas, it, it's not going to convert. It's more, we help them build retargeting funnels and let their paid social teams kind of do that work for, for that. That's mm -hmm. a recommended activity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, on the bottom funnel, middle funnel can be used in that way. We, we honestly, and I think this is one of the reasons we're successful, we kind of describe ourselves as we will build the audience for you, the qualified audience, and then let you convert it. So often paid social teams will then take what we built and do that piece, but we don't actually do that specifically ourselves. Um, and we'll kind of let the people who are experts like Jonathan Dane and client boost who was on your program, um, kind of lean into that side of it. Do you work in conjunction with, with a lot of those, those people? So that, because I could see they work really well together. Yes, we do frequently. So we're very complimentary. We share clients with Jonathan as an example and often work with paid social teams. We do create native social assets for our clients. And that's kind of the way we describe it. It's like, we'll support your social and your email, but we're not actually going to be writing the copy or like managing that strategy as compared to on site. Mm -hmm. Over time, over, you know, um, when you started the company, I'm curious of some of the, what you consider the big wins, like the certain companies that are kind of, wow, I'm working with this company that you were especially proud of. Yeah. So we, I mean, we got some very early on where I was lucky enough to get asked to speak at MozCon, um, mm -hmm. like very early in my career. And that got us Shutterfly and um, Pro Flowers and FTV. Like they were in the audience and heard you speak? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And both are still clients today. So that's wow. kind of uh, one of the awesome early relationships that we established that I'm proud of. Definitely I'm proud of I'm working for clients like Audible and Intuit and um, those types of clients. And uh, Casper is another one that we love. And um, yeah. A, I don't a lot know what people. you can or you can't say. So, so, you know, feel free if you can't answer, but what are some of the things that you have found um, working with Audible? Yeah, I, I can't share too much. I would say a lot of the things we talked about are pretty applicable mm -hmm. here in terms of we really do a lot of the same stuff for most of our clients. It, it can tweak the way it change the way to kind of describe in broad swaths how it, it changes for bigger brands. Not always does an audible need ongoing link building because they have so much link authority already. So at that point, it's just more about high quality content and executing that. Um, and it's basically doing that uh, at scale will allow you to be most effective. Um, and that's what it's Shutterfly is a similar case where they have big brand ton of authority. It's often that mid tier that needs the extra boost from link building to manual link building specifically to kind of get it over the hump. So how does it work, Ross? Let's say Purple Mattress comes to you. Can you still work with them if you're working with another mattress uh no we definitely do we try to avoid um conflict of interest wherever okay. possible got it um and so what i wanted to hear about is um you know growth comment a little bit as well um and you help a lot of different agencies entrepreneurs and and if you check out growthcomment.com you can kind of check out you have an amazing curriculum there i wonder if you kind of touch on a few of the points um, from Growth Comet, and you have a, uh, a community behind that as well. And what made you, first of all, decide to team up with Jonathan from Client Boost and create this? You're like, you're busy enough. You have a company, 85 <laughs> staff. Like, oh, I want to do something else. I, I don't, have, <laughs> don't have enough to do. I mean, I definitely focusing is, is tough. I won't lie. I won't lie about that. But um, yeah, I had Jonathan on for an interview because I'd seen. He's a high growth company. He's done a good job with content marketing specifically. Uh, he's in Southern California as well. Uh, we have an office in San Diego. He's in Irvine. Uh, so it was natural to do that. And then I realized, hey, Jonathan and I have something in common in that he's on the paid side and has really grown an agency. I don't think uh, there's always something new to learn, but we're doing okay from that side and growth as well. So maybe there's something to share there to help other agencies grow. And also learn from other agencies as well in, in the course. So the course is basically a long, um, we, we, and one of the benefits of being in the same area, we did a, a video shoot of kind of all 12 months worth of basically every single thing we could think of that comes up in the agency kind of scenario, whether it's getting new clients, hiring people, recruiting, 
um, letting people go, unfortunately, potentially getting acquired and what you need to do to get acquired, all those things kind of factor into that. Um, so one of the topics is big. I always hear people talk about is hiring and you were on the list of best places to work. Um, what were some of the things that you have done or put in place to make that happen? Yeah. So we, uh, just try to uh, just generally care about people. I, th I think that's really at the end of the day what um, what matters. One of the ways I describe it is I try to build the place I would want to work at and give those same things to everyone else. And that's like work from home flexibility. We have that up to two days a week. Uh, we might expand that with coronavirus scenario once we go back to normal. Um, yeah, what else do we have? What else has been uh, important that, to people? So it sounds like flexibility of work from home. What else has been important that you found? Yeah, uh, trust. I think we're, we don't micromanage people. I think that kind of connects back to it is I've generally not been high stress. Also, I, um, from a culture standpoint, I, I try to make it so if someone makes a mistake, you're not going to get fired when you make a mistake. It's we're going to learn from this. We're going to improve from this. And I think that environment of like low stress is probably contributed to a positive work environment as well and trust specifically. Um, so by no means do we think people can just keep messing up forever, but a one-time mistake, even if it costs us 50,000, which we've had, but we've had people make mistakes that have cost us like a 20 K engagement. Um, and it's fine. Like it's, it's rough, but you learn from it. And I think that kind of builds, uh, it's one of the things Gary Vaynerchuk, I think, said that I really liked at one point is at the end of the day, people want um, want to feel safe and they want to grow. And I like that quote specifically mm -hmm. is like we also try to we've been growing. I think that has been something our team likes and people generally not firing like very quickly at all. Like we have we're very upfront with people communicate when things aren't going well. And that hopefully contributes. I think, you know, the trust piece kind of goes into the foundation, Ross, of a, you hire the right person. Um, and if you do that, you can trust them and you have to micromanage them. So what does that hiring process look like? How do you make sure that you hire the best people or the fit for your company? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it really does come down to that for sure. So we, we have a relatively, we try to make it quick where we, we jump on a call um, and vet the person. If they're good to go, we'll immediately send them a test project that's short, that's respectful of their time and not asking for free work. Once that's approved, th that test project will give us a sense of their writing skills and also their outreach knowledge. On the design side, we give them a very short design project to test their skills. Once that's clear and good to go, that shows they have competency, we, we bring them in and we have a round of three people interview them. They measure them on fit, fire, and function. We ask them to do that anonymously, uh, to, to like email someone, a third party, that score, so there's not group think about how they think about someone. Mm. We bring all that data together in an email, and it gives people like, oh, this person got three, four, five. And you see everyone's opinion. And hopefully within that combined uh, data that we now have about how we feel about this person, we then try to say hell yes or no on this concept, which I got from Derek Sivers is like, is it a clear hell yes on this person or it should probably be a no. Um, and that's been pretty in instrumental, I think, in like hiring good people. So when you say fit fire function, what do you mean by fire? So fire would be like they're brand new in their career and they've launched their own website on the side or fire. Another example where it could be low is, they really haven't done research about siege at all. Mm. Um, it's but like their passion person, or fire. Yeah. It's, it's pretty clear that they care. They want to be doing content marketing specifically is another example um, that shows they're not just trying to get a job. Basically they want this, they're, they, they're, yeah, they're passionate about this career. They're going to work hard to advance and do well. Um, and that can kind of come across, you know, You've grown to 85 or more people over time. What were some of the key hires along the way? Like position-wise? Yeah. Uh, 
I do think our video team has been big. Like that has helped differentiate us having a great video person, Kara Brown, who's on our team because a lot of our competitors do not do that. So I think it creates a quality effect that they can't leverage. Um, I do think it's just a lot of great hires over time for sure. Yeah. Our, what about early hire? on? Like early on, I imagine you were doing the work, right? It was a person of one. And I, I, you said somewhere to someone, I, I don't consider it was an accidental entrepreneur or something like that. Um, so when you first started, what was kind of the first major hire? Like, okay, I can't do all this stuff. What was it kind of the next, next level? Yeah, I was still doing link building at that time. And yeah, hired a great person, Brian Vu, who actually is still with us. Hmm. And he, yeah, it was just great. And he, I think we got lucky and and he built a lot of trust. Uh, He like sent a thank you note after the the new, the email or or the interview um, that was handwritten, which was great. It was like a clear sign. This guy gets it and is awesome. But basically he had just made the decision at a certain point. Like we have enough revenue. I can hire someone on the side. I think at that point I hired him as a contractor. Um, and which often is often the case with newer agencies. We don't do that today anymore. Everyone's full time, but he, yeah, we kind of started them in that direction and that kind of lowered the, it felt like they're lower the risk profile to, to get going there. And then at that time, the priority was just taking the load off the link building or was that what it was? That was the position you were looking for? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was very, it was seven years ago now. So we did do more manual link building without it connected to content. So we had, him and then a hire shortly thereafter was a writer who actually ended up being a unicorn, Barbara, who's also still with us. And she's a front end. She actually had front end development and WordPress shops. So we transitioned her into a, a developer actually, because she was even better at that. So that was like a really lucky hire. I don't know how early we would have hired a developer otherwise. But Yeah. yeah. And, you know, because of, you know, in general, a lot of, founders you know to it's a you know full-time job just helping the company grow and doing all the pieces there in addition to having to do other work within the company and i'm curious the different positions that will allow you to kind of remove yourself from the day-to-day so you can focus big picture so one was you know obviously having someone do some of the actual uh, the technical work and writing what were some of the, those other key positions you put in place so you could kind of remove yourself from the like 100% day to day? Yeah, it started with link building and writing and then it slowly scaled up where we hired a, an EA um, who helped me with a lot of just office management type work. Um, that was relatively early. I think we hired them part-time at first, which is what I would recommend versus kind of jumping in full, full go. They also helped with, yeah, office management, payroll, those kinds of things that I just didn't need to be spending my, there wasn't a high leverage use of my time. Um, Eventually got people to help me with social media. I was almost doing that all myself. I did think the video person was a layer of saving me time. It was a business development person because before I was writing all of our content and this person allowed me to get in front of a camera and do something relatively quickly that still felt high quality which wasn't possibly before where I had to write a long post, put a lot of thought in it. I still put a lot of thought into it, but you get what I'm saying. It helped remove some time. Um, so I highly recommend video for that reason for agencies and a oh, lot of businesses. Totally. Yeah. What about as an executive function, any is specifically with like finance or HR that was helpful? We really had that, that EA person do a lot of those things. We probably waited to wait, way too long to hire an HR person. And that person honestly came in through the mold of being an operations manager. She actually started as EA for me. Then we realized she was a rock star, had HR experience. She ended up managing our office managers remotely and also be an HR person. So yeah, we took a long time to hire HR that um, not gonna, that might not be <laughs> the smartest strategy. We did hire ADP for payroll eventually when we got to a certain size. And they have an HR component mm. that can protect you. Basically say like, if you have an issue where you need to fire someone or something like that, ask them a question. And as long as they give you, you and you follow their advice that protects mm. you. Okay. Um, so I was going to say like ADP, you call ADP. They're like, I need to fire this person. Okay. We'll fire them for you. 
Give me the give me your <laughs> phone number, Ross. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, More, that's interesting. Yeah. Where, where, what are you, your thoughts on having, you know, a, like a, a project manager at what point, how many accounts do you want them managing or um, like people do you want them managing? I know like Richard Branson has certain philosophies around how he creates these structures. I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts. Yeah. So that was definitely a layer that helped me as well. So uh, I was basically the content marketing manager for a while. And then eventually you promoted someone to be a manager. I think gen- we're always kind of figuring out what people can handle. Yeah. I think the way we structure it now is around five direct reports per content marketing manager is felt about right for us for a scaled up manager. We start new managers with like around two to three people, uh, very productive people with senior people on their team as well could sometimes get to six. I re- I have like eight people report to me, honestly, which is way too high. And I'd probably do a bad job for them because of that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's generally the structure. But I would love to hear what um, what his philosophy is for that. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, check it out. It's really interesting. And, and I won't do it just justice by trying to repeat it. But he has certain ways, you know, obviously, he's started many companies and how he kind of silos the companies and how he structures things. Um, so do you typically for the manager do you typically promote them or are they coming in from just specifically in for that position do they go from direct report to manager or yeah we to date we've had a hundred percent of people grow internally into that position i think that's another motivating factor when they see uh you can grow there's people you can point to basically all of our director and cs there's no we don't even technically have a c-suite um besides uh, yeah, I don't even know if I would count myself, but uh, directors have all started as content marketing specialists mm. with us. Nice. So those are great success stories. They can talk to other people and tell them how they did it. Uh, and I think that's probably hopefully motivating for people. You know, first of all, you know, Ross, I always ask um, two last questions um, because it's Inspired Insider. Um, so I'm going to ask them in a second. One is, What's been a low moment challenging that you had to push through? And on the flip side, what's been a proud moment that, you know, after running the company, running companies in general is, is not easy. And uh, I, Jonathan's probably told you the title of his book or future book. Um, I have not heard that actually. Oh, I, th- I thought he mentioned it with you. He's like, how to eat shit is, or something like that. You, has he ever said that to you? I vague, I vaguely remember Okay. That. And I'm like, that sounds disgusting, but I, I kind of know what you're talking about. As a <laughs> um, so there's tough points, but there's also, it makes those proud moments and high points even more rewarding. Um, but first, everyone should check out siegemedia.com. Um, check out what they're doing. If you have a need, you know, of a brand that needs, you know, more clients who doesn't um, and actually wants to produce quality content that you found from this that Ross actually has a really serious thought process behind it, not just throwing up, hoping it goes viral. <laughs> um, so go to siegemedia.com. It's S-I-E-G-E media.com. You can also check out growthcomet.com if you're an agency or service professional. It's a really comprehensive, you look through all of their modules, really comprehensive. And now knowing that they have a community behind it makes it even more valuable. So check both those out. Um, so Ross, on the tough time, low moment that you had to push through um, to overcome to where you are now, um, I mean, we're always overcoming, but what's something that sticks out? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to say we're on the other side of it right now, but this <laughs> situation is definitely the hardest period I've ever gone through um, really? as, as an mm-hmm. agency. Yeah, it's a lot it's of Unprecedented agency. times right now yeah yeah it's we i mean we've we've lost clients before but honestly we've been relatively lucky to not have any major moments of pain um in terms of our growth to date until this situation it's definitely trying um and yeah early on we made some quick decisions on some roles we weren't uh we were already thinking about moving on from, which was a very tough scenario to get through and just kind of 
pushing through this this situation. We we since hired a part time CFO around a year and a half ago, which I highly recommend doing something like that. Around 40, 50 people, it's probably a good time to start doing that. And she's helped our thinking in that regard and being smarter from a cost standpoint. Um, but I'm feeling optimistic now. It's really just I don't I don't know if that's helpful for agency owners at all, but um, I know a lot are going through struggles right now because contracts that are more expendable than the people on your team go first. So many agencies are seeing significant reductions in, in, in their, in their client base because of that, which is rough. Uh, but it's, it's really also a lesson to just be smarter. We're specifically trying to consolidate our office space a little bit coming out of this. Uh, we, we re- and also because work from home is so positive. We have more people who want to do it than ever before. And again, if you trust people that work. So that's one thing we've been doing is uh, we have like a big space. We're going to like remove 30% of it. Just continue to be leaner and smarter as an agency. Um, really think about every cost you have. And I think that'll be make all of us smarter as entrepreneurs coming out of this. Uh, what, what do you, what about early on before you were 85 people? Um, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, to probably be more helpful for other people. Uh, I I don't know. If there's any like dark times, but how I think we got started was I left my college area where I had a lot of friends, and I went to the San Francisco Bay Area um, in San Bruno, which is South San Francisco, and I just uh, it was heads down. I had a full time job, but every waking moment that wasn't that full time job, I hustled on the side. I was writing posts on my personal blog. I was networking and I did that for like two years and it was relatively lonely time period that, that is dark. There's darkness to that of like, didn't really have friends in the area. Um, but I had two years where I just made a ton of headway in my career that I'm sure I wouldn't, we wouldn't be in a good place now. If I hadn't like put in that work and um, gotten to the other side of it. What was the decision to go out on your own? Was that a hard decision or not a hard decision? Not really. I was Mm -hmm. building clients on the side, which was one of the, that's one of the things I highly suggest to people is like build momentum on the side. That's proof that you can do this. And then had a manager who was micromanaging me and I just didn't, wasn't a fan of that style. And that was kind of the, um, the trigger point. And I knew at that point, because I built momentum, I could announce I had quit my job and hopefully get clients. And sure enough, that that's what happened. Nice. Get more clients. Yeah. What about on the flip side of things? Um, what's been a especially proud moment for you in the business? Um, I, I love seeing how everyone at the company has grown. I'm proud of that we've created 85 jobs and um, helped a lot of people grow their careers and given hopefully people good lives and good jobs that they're proud of. Uh, so that, that's something um, I'm, I'm proud of. Anything on a personal level that you're able to do now that you have your own company that before you remember, Oh, I remember those times when the boss is micromanaging me. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely part of it, just c- autonomy. But I think also as an entrepreneur, it's suggest everyone to try to create that earn- entrepreneurship, I think is the word, where you have it within a company. Um, but that that's one of the things. Yeah, it's, it is flexibility, which we didn't have before. But I think you can also have that. And I did have that at the last company until this boss came in. So that's, we can create entrepreneurs even if they don't have to, be stressed about payroll for everybody. Yeah. Entrepreneurs. Yeah. 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 Ross, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out siegemedia.com and growthcomet.com. Um, and I appreciate it. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.